So today what we're going to do is take next steps to wrap up our review, our formal review of software engineering models, generically in module one, the assessment, the final version of the assessment for module one has just been posted and it needs to be completed before Saturday ends this week, 11.59 PM Saturday, okay? Like, like uh, other reconciliations you've done before in, in previous classes, right? Um, I'm sorry, the, the retake. So if you haven't completed the reconciliation for the 1.5 assessment, you wanna make sure that you complete that. And uh, if you haven't brushed up in a bit, you might wanna take a look at the errors or mistakes that you submitted for a reconciliation before you log your final attempt of the module one assessment. So my apologies for the confusion. Once again, we're talking about completing your final attempt of the module one assessment with the, with the final version of the module one assessment. And that again is due, that again is due before Saturday ends. So 11.59 PM, Saturday, 25 February, 2023, okay? And, and uh, I, I mentioned reconciliation after that. You don't have to worry about reconciling the retake, right? You're just, it's just your final attempt. Remember that we're going to drop the high, the lowest of scores between uh, the 1.5 assessment, the first attempt of the module one assessment and the second module assessment. So this is your chance to brush up and, and uh, log maximum points. And so that's due before the week is out. Any questions about module one? Going once, going twice. Hello, Akeem, how are you? I'm good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, in module two. In module two, I have posted the reconciliation. So yeah, I had reconciliation on my mind. We will shortly take up a review of the items in the module two assessment, your first attempt. Uh, I've gone ahead and generated the item analysis. And uh, what we wanna do is focus on those areas. Remember that the original interest for module two was to perform a deep dive in planning and documentation models, the legacy, what we'd call legacy models, right? Or predictive models. And uh, one thing that we wanted to share about uh, this reconciliation is that uh, we'll go ahead and post a link of the item analysis that we're about to conduct so that if you have to refer to our walkthrough in class, it's convenient for you, just like we did in the first module. And finally, since we have completed our review of adaptive software engineering models, I have posted the assessment and this is due by 2.30 PM this Thursday, 23 February. So you need to log your first attempt of the module three assessment before we start class at 2.30 PM on Thursday this week, okay? I will give you time today in class to take up uh, the 3.1 assignment. And I'm gonna walk through that in just a moment after we finish our item analysis. It is a preparation for forming up teams as we take a look at how to uh, organize teams and to uh, take up different capstone solutions, right? So 
Uh, we're getting closer to figuring out what it is uh, that's cool and some possibilities, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Just remember that before the start of class Thursday, we need you to complete your first attempt of the module three assessment, okay? Any questions about module three assessment that's due at 2.30 on Thursday? All right, so hearing none, uh, Deanna, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Glad you could join us. Um, so what we wanna do is take a quick look at our item analysis for the module two assessment. And that's not what we need. That's the item analysis for 1.5. What we need is the 2.3 assessment. And that's what we need. What I'm going to do is uh, print this really quickly and then we'll review each of the items. So for the assessment in module two, uh, students had either 45 or 60 minutes. The average time students used to complete the assessment was 32 minutes. But uh, overall, there were 11 questions. So, so this would have been three minutes per question. That's ample time. Uh, ordinarily, I'd be concerned if there were, you know, 20, 25 questions and, and 32 minutes. That's, that's, that's pretty bad. The average score was a 3.55 out of five. And if you do the math, that's right at 71%. That's not a bad outcome for uh, the, the module two assessment for the first attempt. In terms of discrimination of answers, it's clear that students either got some questions completely wrong or got some, question, some questions completely right as a group. So there was poor discrimination for a number of our questions, but Overall, the difficulty was ranked four easy, five medium, and two hard, which is a, a decent spread. Here is a multiple choice question that posed the greatest challenge for all students because the average score was a zero. And if it turns out that there's a problem with the question itself, we'll go ahead and uh, adjust the score for everyone, but let's take a look at this. So this multiple choice question reads, the SE model that runs longer and costs more to deliver a complete solution is software development lifecycle. Now spiral is a close second. The spiral SE model is also very expensive, runs longer than it's supposed to, but SDLC takes the cake. SDLC by far is the reigning champion for, wow, it took a lot longer than we thought. Wow, it cost us twice as much as we had a budget for. So there you have it. Any questions about this item? So basically for that question, when it, with the statement, it would, also, that means it would be referring to like the most expensive and the long, longest running for a full solution. Right. SDLC 
um, SDLC captures the single distinction of costing more than any other model and taking longer than any other model. It's kind of the combination of the two. Now, spiral takes longer uh, and does cost more, but, but nowhere near as much as SDLC. And I think there's probably, um, there's probably a reason why that's true. Uh, government agencies and governments in particular tend to favor SDLC as a solution development medium. Um, and wherever there's government funding, there's always the possibility to support, you know, cost, especially if it's a serious project that's badly needed you know, and the constituents are complaining, you know, it takes too long to get our taxes back. It takes, it takes too long to dispense um, social security or Medicare benefits. It takes, you know, there, there's often a lot of pressures with government and uh, the government can, I mean, I hate to say it, but a government has the singular distinction of being able to print more money. It's called being over uh, budget and it's called a deficit. The federal deficit is huge. So if this is the flavor of the month or flavor of the decade or flavor of the century <laughs> for federal uh, programs, you know, if, if it runs longer and it costs more, there's a way to manage that. Where other models that are not favored by the government are used in corporations and in private organizations and in public institutions that aren't government like education, right? And so those cost more and they take longer, but 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 not like not like SDLC. I don't want to say you have an unlimited checkbook, but whenever you're it depends on who's in charge of the project and which agency and and how critical. Um, has anyone ever heard of the term black box project? It's a black box project. It's classified, it's secret, it's sensitive. And Congress, Congress reviews the budget for you know federal black box projects. And, and they're often asked, you know, why does it really, it costs $2,800 for a toilet seat. It, it costs $800 for a hammer. What the, what the heck's going on here? Right. And uh, a lot of the people who are running these agencies where it's classified information and it's a public forum, they say, well, that some of that's classified and it's not that simple, but the short answer is yes. And, and that seems ridiculous, but that's their way of that's their way of dealing with the the uh, cost overruns, right? Now that's not very popular, and it can be a death sentence for elected officials who can't rein that in or hold um, companies accountable. There's an in, there's an entire herd, and I I want to say herd, uh, maybe maybe a pod of killer whales would be more appropriate there's a there's a whole uh, cluster of very large very affluent very powerful companies with very powerful lobbies these are paid advocates to pressure you know elected officials that circle washington dc now the highway that circles washington dc y'all can see my screen right I just thought I, would, I can see it. Yeah, I just thought I would share. I just thought I would share this with you because it's extra knowledge that's that's meaningful when you start working with big companies, especially some of the most powerful companies, defense contractors. Okay, so Washington D.C. Beltway. So if we look at images of the DC Beltway, can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. 
So Washington, D.C. is in the middle. That's our nation's capital. And then all around is this superhighway and interstate called the Beltway. And if you travel all around the Beltway, you'll find corporation after corporation after corporation. They're known affectionately as the Beltway Bandits. The Beltway Bandits, okay? And in simple terms, the Beltway Bandits are companies that are very good at federal contracts. They provide services that the federal government needs. And to be honest, there's a market for this, right? The US government is huge, they need a solution. And so they, you know, they submit proposals on how to fulfill the solution. And, and that's, uh, again, software development life cycle is at one time. I haven't checked uh, recently, if that's still the case. I don't know if in the last two or three years, uh, large companies, when I talk about large companies, I'm talking about Boeing, um, Lockheed Martin, McDonnell Douglas, um, Grumman, Northrop, Grumman, I guess. And some of these companies have been bought by other companies. So some of the information I just rattled off might be a little little uh, dated, but, and, and then there, there are research companies, SAIC, uh, Booz Allen, Hamilton, you know, they're just beltway bandits. They're big companies that depend on large federal contracts. And so, yeah, the federal government likes the software development life cycle because of the the, frame, the framework of structure that SDLC provides. And the other predictive models are kind of, well, they're not as, um, they're not as simple or easy to use, but, but it seems like the government really likes the idea of a single development life cycle. And, and um, because they usually have one large project they have to accomplish. Any questions about this item? I know we talked a great deal more about that, but I wanted to develop how and why uh, a good bit more so everybody would understand. Did, did that answer your question, uh, Deanna? Yeah, I understand it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, one multiple choice question that posed a challenge for students. The SE model with the most expensive development environment. We're talking about the tools that the programmers, the software engineers use themselves. Which model is the most expensive in terms of the programming tools? Not the project, not the whole solution, the tools that the programmers are using themselves. That is RUP, because RUP is an example of CASE, computer-aided software engineering. And, and that, that's an IBM thing. Um, in fact, they've protected that concept as intellectual property. It's costly, it's, it's expensive, uh, but there's all sorts of automated tools to make the coding process uh, more efficient and faster, but more to the point, it's centered on business. It's centered on the business process. Uh, so the entire development environment is designed to support and reinforce the administrative and finance aspects of the company, the operations of the company, the, the business process of the company. And for that reason, it gives the programmers a way to frame their development in that context. And so that's one reason why it's so expensive. So when we're talking about the development environment, we're not talking about the project as a whole. We're talking about the tools that the software engineers use as they're completing 
or building the solution. Um, I need 60 seconds and I'll be right back. Please hold. Yes. Okay. So the next question that posed a challenge for students is a multiple choice question about Fred Brooks. Fred Brooks was a Turing Award uh, candidate, and I think he was actually awarded the Turing. wasn't wasn't just a nomination. Um, and he provided some keen insights into software engineering uh, early in the history of the discipline. So he was chosen for a Turing Award offering keen insights regarding predictive model limitations. So uh, in your study guide and in uh, related references, you'll, you'll see a mention of this. He was not chosen for a Turing Award because he led the Agile Manifesto. So nobody fell for that, but it said he was chosen for a Turing Award and deduced the basic model of modern computer architecture components. That wasn't Brooks. Who was it that did the computer architecture components? Anyone? John von Neumann. Does anyone remember CSC 241? John von Neumann. Hello. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay. Yes, it was a trick question. Okay. This one we can skip over because it was multiple choice. The Blackboard algorithm cannot calculate, you know, the student discretion about this because everybody got it right. The max score was a quarter of a point and everyone got it. So you don't have to worry about covering that one. There's a couple like that. Let's keep moving. This multiple answer question posed a challenge for many students. One advantage of software engineering models that incorporate an incremental strategy is that it allows the installed user base access to new features as the current investment is preserved. That is correct. The incremental strategy incorporates refactored code gracefully as service packs. So incremental, we talk about when you have companies that put out service packs, that's uh, it's typical of an incremental software development approach. It provides another revenue stream marketed as software assurance. So companies will say, hey, um, I know you bought the license, but if you buy support or you buy software assurance, which is like free upgrades to the new versions, we'll, we'll come out with new and updated code uh, components, you know, the the core of the application, when we have uh, version upgrades, you're entitled to those. And so uh, looks like, looks like a uh, number of students only picked some of the answers. So all three of those are correct. Now, the answer, it provides a method for James Martin rapid application um, that's an adaptive model that has nothing to do with planning and documentation, okay? The natural transition to incorporate agile variants, um, but, but nobody chose those answers, so. I have a question about that one. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think, I don't know, when I saw they said one advantage, and I, I had selected one because I don't know. I thought you it was supposed to be maybe a multiple choice, and you accidentally made it a select uh, multiple. So that's why I was kind of confused for that question. Oh, Same with me. 
Oh, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, in the final version that we do for the retake, we'll change this so it reads, select all that apply. <laughs> One advantage of SE models is that for a, a, an advantage, yeah, select all that apply, an advantage of SE models that incorporate an incremental strategy is, and that's how we'll word it going forward, okay? Is that a deal? Okay. Okay. I could discount that, but I think I think we want to make sure that everybody gets all three of those. Um, I can toss the question and credit it, but what I'd have to do is increase the value of other questions that, in order to make the five point for the assessment. And what may happen is that if other questions were incorrect, then, but now they're worth more that you'd actually, you would also lose points in the trade-off. It's a little tricky. I don't know if I'm making sense. Now, if this were the, if this were the retake, the final version of the assessment, uh, I would, I would do just that. I would go ahead and just, I would discount this question because of its wording and, uh, and that would be that. So if you would like to have me consider changing the score of this uh, assessment, um, please stick around when our session comes to an end and let's discuss it further, okay? I'm, I'm not opposed to changing that decision, but um, I, I do get where people said that and I appreciate both of you ladies for speaking up and and calling that out. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's also why we include a field in your um, credit as you log uh, submissions for additional credit too. So that's another way to work around this. All right. Multiple choice. This was a question that posed a challenge for one of our students, which of these predictive SE models aligns business and financial interests with software development? Um, RUP is the model name. RUP is an example of computer assisted software engineering, which is a category of it, it's it's a it's a method or category of software engineering models. And there are competitors with IBM who could argue that, well, you know, there's you know their suite of uh, development tools and so on you know, is very much a case, um, case implementation. And I'm, you know, I, I don't know if um, JetBrains would be an example of this or some others, but there could be some commercial programming environments that would claim that they're also computer assisted software engineering, uh, res you know, they have resources in the mix. Um, we don't have a model called case. We have a model called RUP and it's an example of case. I, I hope that helps clarify. Any questions about this? All righty. Uh, this next one Which model creates conditions that require the need for frequent refactoring? Uh, this answer is actually, it's stated that way verbatim in the study guide. Sashimi incremental. It's an enhanced version of waterfall and it 
creates conditions that require the need for refactoring the code frequently because you're going into the next phase of development and you discover new things that are problematic from the previous phase of development. So you have to jump back, refactor code. And sashimi waterfall looks like waterfall, except that the stages overlap. Any questions about this one? This is the last item we will review. The other ones were scored um, correct completely by all students. This last question reads, it's a multiple answer question. A contract differs from a statement of work with respect to several important criteria. Select the statements below that accurately reflect these differences. The first one, contract, uh, contract address absolutes, I should read contracts, plural, address absolutes or non-negotiables. Statement of works are intentionally flexible, that is true. So contracts are very specific, SOWs are stated in general terms and it's designed to support the, the, the people who create the solution. So an SOW is created for those who perform the tasks, a contract for those who commission them and pay for it, right? So that, that's an additional distinction. Now, some students answered, a contract is created for those who perform the tasks, an SOW for those who commission them. Well, that, that's the reverse. Any questions? Okay. Well, I'd like to show you the, so everybody knows what's due this Thursday, correct? What's due at the start of class this Thursday? What must you complete before the start of the next class? Absolutely. The module three assessment, first attempt, right? Everybody with me? Can everyone see this screen? Do I need to make it bigger? How's I that? can see. Okay. So this is a pretty simple form and it's designed as a table. And here's what the table looks like when you download the form. There are four sections. Now I had a hand drawn simpler version of this that we shared in class before. And so there's a little added clarity here. It says plan and document versus agile. Describe here whether you want a traditional software engineering model used for your project. So what you're doing is answering as if you could make the decision. Do I want an adaptive model or do I want a more traditional model, right? Or a project or a later model based on agile concepts, right? So do you want traditional or agile? Now, you can't just say agile. Here it says, be sure to provide rationale for your choice. Now, when we say rationale, we're saying, we want you to take some time to compose a quality answer that includes why you think your choice for each response works best. And this is really important. If any one any one of the four sections does not include rationale. If you don't take a little time to say, well, I say this because, and here are the following reasons, right? It's just, it doesn't have to be a lengthy answer. It doesn't have to include a lot of detail, but we want you to pro provide some, some reason why this is important. Now, 
this is actually the first half of the speed dating activity. So what you're going to do between now and 2.30 p.m. Thursday, so that's the other thing that's due 2.30 p.m. Thursday is your completion of this form personally, okay? The reason it's due by 2.30 Thursday is that we're going to use your submissions and we're going to engage another round of speed dating like activity so that everybody's submission is referenced in round robin. Everybody's submission is referenced in round robin fashion. And so uh, in order to do that, if everybody's going to attend on Thursday at 2.30, and, and we're submitting, you know, everybody submitted their, their speed dating preference form, then we have the tools to engage the activity. Now, this is the part I want everybody to understand very plainly. This is the one that ought to be in red. No opportunity to submit will be possible. Take some time to compose a quality answer that includes why you think your choice for each response works best. But if you don't turn it in by 2.30 p.m. Thursday and we try to have the activity, what am I saying? Uh, excuse me? Yes? I got a quick question. Uh-huh. So about one of the assignments, you told me that I need to add CS420 to one of my assignments and resubmit. What are you saying now? Like you told me that I need to resubmit one of my assignments. Yeah, not this one. We're not talking about this one. That's a different assignment. Okay. Okay, as soon as we finish walking through this, I'm going to turn each of you loose so you can use the rest of the time in class to finish the speed dating preference form because it's that important. So in three minutes, when we end the class what am i saying in three minutes when we end the class if we get to 2 30 p.m thursday and well you had something else you needed to do so you you rushed off and you, you told yourself oh I'll, I'll deal with that later it's not there's not going to be any opportunity what we're gonna we're gonna conduct the activity and if if your form isn't there then you're not you're not going to have any practical way to be involved. So you'll lose more credit on the assignment that's going to be posted for Thursday, the live assignment where you have to work some things with your peers. Okay. You'll have a live assignment on Thursday at 2 30 PM. Everyone must attend. Attendance is mandatory. You'll see this. I'll put it out before class on Thursday. And what do you have to bring? Well, we have to have the speed dating preference form completed. And you won't be able to participate if you don't have it. So this is one thing you want to make sure you can do. And you're going to find that in a capstone project, working with team members, there are times where each of you are going to have to adjust your priorities accordingly. You're going to have to make sure that Okay, if I'm supposed to demonstrate a prototype for this module, I have to have a prototype working for this module. And depending on the software engineering model that your team's using, if you're having challenges before you reach that point, then, then there's a protocol to follow. What happens if you know my module isn't working like it's supposed to? Yeah. Okay. So I hope I'm very clear about that. So take some time to compose the quality answer why you think that's what the word rationale means. Okay, that's another way to put it. Any questions about the expectation for the speed dating form before we finish completing the review? Okay. So in the first quadrant, you're gonna put whether you want to do the traditional, you want to you want to choose a traditional model or you want to use an adaptive model. We're not worried about which one at this point. We just want to know 
are you you know are you more more old school and you like doing the traditional stuff and you're going to work with government a great deal and you think this is going to be a better use of time to learn software development life cycle and you know let's work as a team and use software development life cycle because there's big grants big money big contracts and that's your jam and you're going to help provide integrated solutions for a government agency that's actually pretty cool right then quite frankly anybody that aspires to that that's that's impressive right now the other side is also impressive you may say i'm going to and if you're listening to the words i'm giving you i'm i'm kind of walking through how i might provide rationale for this first quadrant right let's pretend that i want to work with silicon valley giants i want to work with google i want to work with facebook i want to work with tiktok and snapchat and all those coolness companies right so and they use agile uh in some of their work so i i want to take my capstone project for my you know as a senior that's what i want to do and so that's a good example of you know a decision it's like okay i'm traditional i'm going to do planning and document or i'm i want to be adaptive i'm going to do agile and i've just stated the reasons okay and we're recording this so i'm going to post this in in our uh in our resources folder as soon as we're done does anyone have any questions or comments based on what I've just shared with you here in the first quadrant. Okay, hearing none, second quadrant. Describe here what type of solution you think would make an interesting team project. Now, can you just say, hey, I wanna do something to help students register faster at UVI. That's not rationale. Let me say that again. That's a description of what you want to do for the project. But that doesn't explain why you think it would make an interesting team project. You could say, this would make an interesting team project because we've all experienced the delays and it's almost painful to get registered for some, some of the semesters, they're, they're just, Oh, the class isn't offered now. Oh, I, you know, oh, but the instructor is going to work in this mode and they're in person and I, I have a job and I need an online class. You can say that the process of enrolling each season, you know, could, could be enhanced, could be improved in, in a couple of ways. And again, you don't have to offer a lot of detail you can summarize a brief statement, but I want your rationale here as well. Please avoid just saying, I wanna fix the, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, I'm gonna have a solution that does this. Because that's only one half of the answer, okay? What we're really doing is testing your worthiness as a teammate right now. Let me repeat that. This is the kind of stuff that it's a dynamic of team efforts, right? Who can we depend on? Who's going to follow through and do as directed? Because if they can't, what does that mean for the others in the team? Well, if you're going to complete the capstone project, does that mean one or two people get to do all the work and the other two just, no, they don't really get it. They don't really understand. It's like, mm, no, that's not it. See, if we have students in this class that can't set the stage for forming up a team properly in the first place, maybe they don't need to be involved in the capstone project at all. That would mean that you get to do this course over again. That would mean you don't complete a graduation requirement. That would mean a lot of things. But this is a capstone course. It's 400 level. You're all seniors. And all of you have 
slugged out. I mean, frankly, all of you have slugged out greater challenges than other courses. I don't see anybody in our class having that issue, but this is not, this is not the time for a quick, short answer that we spitball. Because when we form teams, you're going to be stuck from now until May working a project with a specific model to produce a certain solution. And if those planets don't align, it can be very painful. Does everyone understand intuitively the time and energy and quality of thought I am being so careful to articulate right now. And this is, this is, uh, mm, yeah, no software engineering textbook author is gonna share with you what I just shared with you. But I've watched this play out over a 25 year period and I have fired solution teams and sent them home. I have done that personally. And sometimes it's happened because they have a doofus they can't manage and they can't deal with. And it's important. It's a lot of times people don't do well when they don't have a good fit. The goal of this activity is to get to know each other and to get to understand what kind of interests, what kind of team dynamic we can build here. And so this is where I'm asking everyone to, to just take Again, take some quality time. I need each of you to unmute your microphone one at a time as I call your name to respond and say, yes, I understand what you've just related. And then feel free to ask any questions or clarification or comments or anything at that point. Deanna, could you please unmute your microphone? Yes, I understand. Great. I have no questions either. Thank you. Akeem. Akeem? Yes, I understand. Okay. Do you have any questions or comments or observations you'd care to share at this time? Not at this moment. Okay. Ms. Bedford, Shanoa. I understand. I have no questions. Okay. Thank you much. Schneider. Uh, hello, DM. Yes. Do, do you understand uh, what, yeah. we just, what we've just uh, presented? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, if there's ever any doubt, that's what the recording is for, right? So if we ever get further down the road and people are like, no, oh, I don't remember that. And it's like, okay, I'm going to play back this recording. Um, did you have any questions or observations you'd like to share, Snyder? at this time i just have a for my two point for my way see i can find it the, the other assignment why don't we take that up as soon as we finish reviewing the other quadrants on the form okay all right all right okay moving right along let's talk about the third quadrant right third quadrant language or integrated development environment of preference. When we say IDE of preference, we're talking about the integrated development environment you personally prefer to use. And I also, I also want you to think here about the database side of this, okay? So an important aspect of the programming environment is not just the language, and it's not just the suite of tools in a fully integrated development environment, right? But I want you to think in terms of the database, the, the back end, right? So that needs to be a component of your answer. Describe which programming language and or IDE you prefer to use for your work on the project. And if you say, I prefer to use JetBrains uh, because uh, I've done other projects, then you're providing rationale. If you say, because 
I've used this language since I was a freshman and I'm very comfortable with this kind of database platform because I've had it in two other classes. That's rationale. I need each of you to provide an answer, including rationale. Any questions about quadrant number three? No. Okay. I can't wait till Thursday. <laughs> if everybody does this, right? Uh, Thursday is gonna be really interesting because we take this information and then we kind of turn it sideways and inside out. And that's where the fun begins. So I know I've had some very uh, strong assertions here today, but don't don't let that, um, don't worry. Uh, I'm just really stressing this point that everybody needs to give some quality thought to this, right? Finding the good fit and the right project and you know agreement on the tools that you're gonna use to go. If you get that right, if you get that much right, there are a lot fewer problems later on. I don't know if this makes sense, but you know, you get halfway through the, the capstone project and you find, well, I don't like using SQL. I don't like using MySQL anyway. That's the dumbest, it's open source and it's free, but Oracle keeps changing it. They bought it. It used to, it used to be truly open source, but Oracle bought it so they could kill it. So they could make it stupid. So, and I'm just saying that's that I'm I'm uh, offering that as an example, as if I were a student and I had reservations or hesitations about Oracle. Um, so that comment was an example of somebody who was providing rationale and and very colorful rationale. This is not my specific uh, preference or statement about MySQL or about Oracle. I just wanna be clear about that. I am not in endorsing or uh, excluding any database environment from consideration. And I don't want my comments to um, sway anyone. It's just a colorful, you could say, oh my gosh, I've been using MySQL and I'm really comfortable with it, but now everybody's all about using SQL Server and a Microsoft machine. And uh, we've never done that before. What's with that? You know, what, what, what's wrong with using the MySQL platform and using an Oracle backend? Because, you know, the two are very much aligned in terms of the environments. That would be a great example of, of relevance. So there you have like two versions, opposite ends of the spectrum. Is everybody comfortable with the language and IDE thing here? Yes. Okay, so we're not just gonna give an answer, we're also gonna explain why. All right, days and times available for team sessions. Now we hinted at this in the previous, in our previous uh, session, I think it was last week or so, where we said, we need to know the days and times you're available to work with members of your team. Don't you dare. Now, this is where I am going to get emphatic, and I'm telling people right up front, if I get the fourth quadrant here from half of this class and they go, well, I have uh, two part-time jobs and I'm also taking care of a niece and um, we just adopted a puppy and I have an overload of 18 credits and um, I'm available Sunday afternoon from 3.30 to 4 o'clock. I'm gonna ask you to drop the course. I will send you an email and I will ask you to make an appointment with the Dean of the College of Science and Math while you still can and withdraw from this course. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Again, one at a time, I need you to unmute your microphones and say, oh, I heard that. Yeah, I heard it loud and clear. Yes, okay. Deanna? I heard it. Okay, Akeem? Understood. Okay. Shanoa? I heard you. Okay, Schneider? Yeah, I heard it. Okay, now I was being melodramatic there and I wanna express my appreciation to all of you for 
well, putting up with that. But I got a little edgy for a reason, okay? If this is going to work and it's going to go well, you are going to have to make adjustments. You are going to have to be available. This is a four credit, 400 series capstone course for your entire major. This is where you pull together all of the things you've learned over the four previous seasons or however many seasons you've been at it, right? This is where you bring all of your knowledge, skills, and abilities to the table. But in simple terms, we don't have room for someone who's going to play hard to get. And if you can't shuffle something around and make this happen from now until the end, you need to pull the ripcord and bail now and come back next year. Right. Come back in the fall and, and and oh, but we don't do software engineering in the fall. So you'd have to come back next spring. Well, you could do it in the summer. Sometimes we do software engineering in the summer. Sometimes we don't have enough students to form a team. So we can't. You can't be a team of one. I'm going to say that again, because there's another student who is working asynchronously from the sidelines. And that would be Eldon Dane. And some of you may have met him or not. But the reality of this course is it's a team sport. So here's what I expect. I want to see a minimum of three days and two to three hour blocks in each of those. Okay. A minimum of two or three days. No, a minimum of three days. A minimum of three days during the week where you have a block of two to three hours during those three days. And no, you can't do two days and three hours each. You can't. So figure out which day you could. Now, it could be different times. It could be the morning. It could be the afternoon. You could work. You could say, well, I can do that kind of time, but I'm going to have to work in a team's environment. I'll have to work asynchronously. Is it possible for Eldon Dane, as a member of one of our teams, who is working completely asynchronously, to function well as a team member? Absolutely. But it means that he's going to have to open up teams, right? So he goes and you, your team agrees to work in teams, and that could be convenient for you as well. The point is, is that you have to have a serious commitment of time each and every week because there are things you got to get done. So on average, about three days, two to three hours each of those days, you're looking at anywhere conservatively between six and nine or 10 hours, six and nine or 10 hours, right? We're not going to hold our class for instructional purposes. For those of you that have been here during class time, uh, well, that's half, you know, that's half the battle. If there's another, if there's another time segment before that or after that where you can extend, you know, what we're going to do is host class sessions. We're going to make use of the breakout rooms in Zoom. And you can uh, form up in your breakout rooms and work on stuff. When we would otherwise have class. So at a minimum, everybody can do that much, but I would be remiss in my duties as a software engineering instructor and to tell you that you could do everything you need to in just class time. That's, that's not realistic, right? So you can list the class times and days. But when you add up the amount of hours, that's only one full day, right? That's like three hours between the two days. Does everybody get what I'm saying? Just throwing, yeah. that, out, just throwing that out there as a little less edgy uh, point about this, right? Okay. So when you finish... Uh, putting your information here on each of the quadrants of your speed dating form. You're going to save it with your first initial and last name and upload it 
At 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, we are going to do an item analysis of everyone's assessment attempt in which module? Module three. Module three, thank you very much. And we're gonna make quick work of that. And then we're gonna use these forms and we're gonna do another related activity to take it to the next level, okay? All right. Thank you for joining us today. That's all I had planned for today. Good luck on your final attempt of the module one assessment you have from now until the end of the week. Please, please reconcile your mistakes on the module two assessment and good luck uh, on your first hello? attempt of the module three assessment. Yes, Schneider, yes. why don't you stick around and we can talk about the other interest, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna stop the session and then I'm gonna open it up again in 60 seconds. Can you join back in at that time? All right. All right, very good. Good day all, thanks for being here. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.